Hi, it's Dr. Lori. Welcome back to Ask Dr. Lori. This is where you ask the questions and me, the expert, I give you the answers. So all different ways you can ask questions on our website, drlorivee.com, social media, you can write them right here in the comments, whatever you want to know, I'm going to answer those questions for you. Here we go. Let's see what we've got today. <laughs> How do I satisfy a buyer, Dr. Lori, who bought my item online, but now wants all this addif additional information and certification about it? They want me to lower the price now after they bought it. Oh, sure. <laughs> well, that's what they want you to do. So a lot of you are spending a lot of time when time is money, so you're spending a lot of time and a lot of money with these people who have already bought your item and now they want certifications, identifications, I didn't do this, what about this, do you know about the background, all this stuff, once they bought it at a particular price. So, um, you know, I don't want you to spend that extra time. You know, once it's sold, it should be sold, right? But it's hard. So a couple of things that are happening here. And what I think you have to think about with respect to this is, is this a tactic? So... Is this a tactic? Is this the buyer now saying, oh, you know what? I bought it because I wanted to get that person, you, the seller, to actually take that thing down. I want you to take it down because you're competing with whatever. Maybe something that they have similarly selling on another site. You don't know. Or maybe they just want all of this information and they want to slow you down or they want to say, well, you don't have this information and because you don't have this information, I think you should sell it to me for a lower price. Hey, once it's sold, you know, they agreed on a price. It's a fair market, you know, it's a fair market exchange. So basically, you know, it wasn't a forced sale where you twisted their arm. That's what it is. So I think with respect to these, you know, you have to go back to that particular buyer and say, hey, you know, this is what we have and this is the information I have. If you want me to go and get more information, that costs time, that costs money, that costs, you know, so there's a cost to that. Uh, you have to see about that with respect to tactics. It's not easy to sell online, but this is a very typical thing that's happening more and more. And a lot of people will come to me and say, Dr. Laura, you know, I need you to do this. I need you now to help me identify this and authenticate it and help me with it. Of course, I can help, but this question is a good one. It's one that we always, that we always see oftentimes. As you know, I oftentimes will say, you know, when you're watching the videos, I hope you're getting a lot of information. I hope it's helping. And with the Ask Dr. Lori's, I always say, of course, I pick these, these particular questions from a bowl. And here's this episode's bowl. This particular bowl is kind of a trick. And when I say that, this particular bowl is, being, is kind of a trick because this particular bowl is really not a very old bowl at all. It actually is a bowl that's trying to look like an antique. It's made in Asia. It's mass produced to look American. It's also a piece of stoneware. It's very, very quickly made, mass produced, very large numbers, and they're sold in all different types of shops. So while you might think this looks old, this bowl isn't old at all. Probably dates to about 2015 and value on this bowl is just about $10. So be careful when you're looking at things that look, of course, like they are antiques or vintage. Well, we want to make sure that you, that you look for the quality and not for something else. Okay, let's keep going. So I always tell you to share the pieces, to share the videos, to tell your friends. And, you know, it's kind of like when you, you could make it a drinking game, really. You know, when Dr. Lori says share, we all drink. <laughs> I don't think that's a bad idea, but I really need you to share. It's important. You got to share. Thanks for spreading the word about all the information that I'm giving you, and I'm happy to give it to you. I want you all to learn it. I want you to be successful. I want you to get it. I know you're hearing other people copy me. I know you're hearing that. I get it. I hear it too. I know. But basically, you know where to go. You know where the real answers are. They're right here. So just keep following me and keep sharing, and we'll do great. I have an old painting, Dr. Lori, the frame's damaged. If I put a contemporary frame on this painting, will I hurt the value? Oh, that's a good question. Should I trash the old frame? Okay, two good questions. First of all, if you have an old painting and you have the original frame, try to keep the original frame if you can. But if you have an old, and don't trash the old frame, right? Don't just go, oh, I'm throwing this out. Because that old frame, while it may not be in good shape, is period. That means it's of the particular period as the as the actual painting, so they work as a unit or a set in terms of time period. A lot of potential buyers or collectors like that if you have it, even if it's not in good shape, because they may take your old frame and decide that they're going to put the money into restoring it. So, okay, if you want to and you don't have the old frame or you, you already trashed it or, oh, Dr. Lori, I just left it, I didn't care. Okay, if you already did that, 
then you want to put a new frame on it, it won't hurt the value of the old painting at all. And remember, frames are very important for paintings. Why? Because they protect the canvas, they can protect the stretcher where the canvas is stretched over. They're very important for stability of a work, on, of, a work of art. So you want to maintain a frame either way. Now, in contemporary works, you know, there are a lot of contemporary paintings that are meant to be unframed, or artists will just put black tape, contemporary artists put black tape around it to instead of a frame, but it's good to invest in a frame. I'm a big advocate of, you know, the framers and folks who do framing. It's a good idea to invest no matter what oil on canvas you have to invest in a frame. So a new frame is better than no frame. <laughs> okay. Uh, what's next? Uh, I don't like that one yet. Let's pin this one. <laughs> I have a question for your bowl. Hey, it's a question for the bowl. Okay, cool. <laughs> How can unmarked Murano glass be identified as opposed to all other art glass? I absolutely love, love, love your YouTube videos. I'm a huge fan. I appreciate all your knowledge. Well, I hope you do. I hope you appreciate it. And I think you all do. Um, I hope you appreciate the honesty that goes along with all of this knowledge, as well as that I'm on your team. I really want you to do this. I know you can do this. And I know, and I've heard that many of you are making a lot of money following me, and I'm happy about that. So the real question was, can, how can unmarked Murano glass be identified as opposed to all other art glass? Okay, so unmarked Murano glass. Murano is marked and then a Murano, sometimes certain periods it'll have a label or a sticker and sometimes the stickers go by the wayside and you know. So you can tell by quality and materials and you can tell by style and materials. So what happens? You have, to con you have to start to learn about Murano. So when you just go, oh, it's Murano, it's not that easy. And not all Italian glass is Murano. And not all art glass is Murano. So people are surprised when I say, well, this is what you have to do. And it's not pretty. It's work. You remember work, you know. So what you have to do is you basically have to look at Murano pieces and look at who is working and, and, and making these. There's hair on my face, okay. <laughs> who is actually working and, and designing these particular pieces and identify their style. So it's the same way as you identifying, you know, my style. So you don't usually see me in a crop top and or a tank top because I really can't wear it because there's an awful lot going on here, right? So you know my style is a little bit more classic, a little more reserved if you're thinking about fashion style. Same thing for Murano. If you're looking at the individual designers who worked at, for Murano, the great Venetian glass house, right? You would start to identify their style and you'd understand a little bit more about which pieces are basically those large, beautiful, dramatic pieces and which are a little bit more understated and who actually designed what. This takes time and expertise, and that's why people say, oh, I can't believe your whole knowledge. Well, I have to learn all of that. People who are just holding up things in front of the camera to you on videos are not learning all of that so they can specify, so I can specify for you what to look for. It's very important to do that, but it takes time. You have to familiarize yourself. You have to look at a lot of Murano. It takes a lot of effort to do that. So how do you tell if it's unmarked? I want you to look for quality materials. A lot of times you can look for those nice heavy bases that Murano is known for. You should look for a clear glass, a clear glass, whether it's color or not, that doesn't mean it couldn't be color. Colored glass can be clear too. And then you want to also look for that idea of, again, lovely forms that are known to Murano. So look at a lot of it. I always say educate your eyeballs in places where you are not tempted to buy, like museums, and you'll be able to identify more about Murano. Okay, next. Uh, let's see. I have an oil painting by a local artist that signature is disappearing. Oh, that's not good. That's not good. Is the painting only authentic for 10 years? Only authentic for 10 years? No, a painting is not only authentic for a particular amount of time. If you have an authentic painting, it's authentic always. Now, I can't find the artist now to get her to re-sign it. Oh, okay. So you know the artist. She signed it. It's starting to disappear for some reason. Where are you keeping this this painting. This painting is probably not being kept in the right place. Or somebody's rubbing up against it. Do you have someone who's cleaning it? Are you are you cleaning it or dusting it with something? I mean, these it shouldn't disappear. How is it disappearing? It's like magic? What do you mean it's disappearing? That's not right. So basically, is the painting only authentic for 10 years? We know that's no, that's not true. I can't find the artist now to get her re-signed. If she were to re-sign it, this is another thing you want to think about. If she were to re-sign it, now you have an artwork from, you know, 10 years ago, and then she's signing it more 
contemporaneously. Uh, that's not a good thing either. So what you have to do, just like you protect the whole painting, you have to protect, of course, the signature. I don't know what you're doing to it that is disappearing. Um, but again, it is not a particular amount of time. Uh, if it's authentic, it's always authentic. It's not going to change. You should document where you got your pieces. And this is true for anything, whether you have disappearing signatures or not disappearing signatures. What you need to do is you need to, in fact, document where you got something. So if you go out and you buy a particular piece that adds to your collection, I want you to document. When did you get it? Where did you get it? And I want you to keep a file. And I want you to keep a file for, in fact, on your computer, for, in fact, those folks who come after you, who your errors, when you want to go sell it, all of that is called provenance. It relates to the French word to prove it. And the idea is that you have a lineage or a background for these pieces. It'll be important for people who get it after you. It'll also be important, of course, for um, your heirs if you leave them to people. Okay. Do Star Wars action figures by Kenner from 1977, that's right, okay, really have to be in their original packaging to be worth selling? No, they don't have to be in their original packaging to be worth selling, but they will be worth more if they're in their original packaging. Make sense? Pretty simple, right? If you've got a Star Wars figure, I don't know, Darth Vader, you know, Luke Skywalker, uh, I don't know, any of the Princess Leia, whomever, in from Kenner from 1977, the little, of course, fi action figures, in the original packages, it's worth more. But if it's not in the original package anymore, that doesn't mean you shouldn't sell it. That means you just can't get as much for it as if it were in the original package. Okay, good question, thanks. Star Wars, always fun. <laughs> Disney has a new Star Wars coming out. They have a new Star Wars land, don't they? Please continue with the Q&As. Do you like the Q&As? You like the Ask Dr. Lori's? I hope you like them. Uh, they were actually, they were originated because of so many people asking so many questions. And I wanted to get to these questions. And I want you to know, you know, my opinion after, you know, 30 years in the field. You know, I want you to know what really actually happens behind the scenes. Because you have a lot of people who are basically, you know, calling themselves experts and Basically, I want you to know what it's like to have worked in museums and lived with art, to have, you know, worked with auction houses, to work with, you know, major universities and major, of course, art collectors for a long, long time. Understand what the buying and selling is all about, how to identify the quality art and antiques and collectibles. So, yeah, I'm glad you like the Q&As. I like doing them, too. I watched and shared your, your videos about jewelry appraisals, and you called White Jade... Um, and you called white jade and nephrite. I've always been curious of why you called it white jade, and usually the term is nephrite jade, and it's white and cream colored. Keep up the content, and I love learning from you, and I like your signature sass. Well, I do have my signature sass. Anyway, um, terms matter, you know, terms matter a lot. And um, what's interesting about this is I get a lot of pushback about a couple of terms that I use that I have over the years. You know, I've written books on sculpture, and one of the terms that I get a lot of pushback on is patina. And patina is an application of color on sculpture. It's an application in the foundry process. And a lot of people go, oh, well, patina's changed. And they're looking up, you know, they're looking at dictionary definitions of patina and how it's changed over the years. I'm a purist when it comes to, of course, terms and terminology, because terminology will matter when you're trying to identify pieces. And I'm big on the identification, and it has to be right. And the other thing that I like to do is I like to, of course, teach people what these terms mean. So. Uh, a common term for white jade, nephrite, is uh, the term that relates to, of course, what's called tremolite. And tremolite is a compact kind of stone. It's usually white. The Asians will relate white jade, nephrite, to, in fact, a calming mood. So if you wear nephrite, you should bring you calm. Maybe I need more nephrite in my life. <laughs> Be calm, you know. But basically, um, nephrite and the idea of white jade is in fact something very, very desirable. What's interesting about, of course, this is uh, common or compact tremolite, this particular stone, can come in a range of colors. We think of it as white or white jade, but it can come into the, the light greens, even the greens, and sometimes even into the light blacks or a charcoal kind of color. So you'll start to see where these particular types of stones have different properties depending on where they naturally develop. So white jade and nephrite terminology, important, but in fact, I do use them, and I use nephrite sometimes, and I use white jade some other times. Good question. Thank you for asking. Let's see what else is in the bowl, the cheap, lousy bowl. Okay. 
I know people sell furniture hardware like knobs and drawer pulls without the actual dresser or chest, but can you sell antique parts like game board pieces, like wine decanter stoppers, single saucers without teacups? Oh, okay, so you want to know if you have the hardware, can you just sell the hardware? You know, it was really interesting about 10 years ago, everybody started to sell architectural salvage. And having taught the history of modern architecture at major universities for a long time, in addition to teaching art history and modern art and impressionism and all these other things that I've taught over the years, you know, a lot of people were basically, these buildings were coming down and they were going in and they were basically taking everything for salvage, right? So what they would do is they would take everything for salvage, whether it would be a door jam or a door knob or a railing or a rail post, and they would basically take it out of a building. Maybe the building was going to be, you know, torn down, take it out of the building and then resell it. And it reminded me of a story. So I'm called into a house. It's got to be, uh, it's got to be 15 years ago. Uh, it's a long time ago. Anyway, I'm called into a house and they say to me, the person at the house says to me, um, Dr. Lori, we're here to have you look at the fireplace tiles. We want you to look at the fireplace tiles. And I walk in and I walk in and I say, well, the fireplace tiles are very nice, but you really probably want to take a better look at the $100,000 wrought iron railing that's going up the main staircase. Oh my gosh, the one hundred thousand! I didn't know that. We have to put the house on the market. Oh, I better call the realtor. This whole thing. Yeah, because what's happening with architectural salvage is basically the same as this question, parts. It's about parts. So when you have the parts of a house, like a doorknob or like a backsplash or Victorian tiles, which are beautiful in some of these old homes, you know, those pieces alone can be valuable and can be sold individually. So a lot of people are getting into that. Yes, you can sell antiques for parts. For example, you know, I, I, I've done video um, TV appearances where people have said, well, I have this piece and it's, it's basically broken in parts, like is a, a table slot machine where you don't actually have, you know, the hand crank anymore where you can pull it down, right? The arm, the one arm bandit part of it, the, the actual arm. So can I get one of that same time period by that same manufacturer, like a Mills Novelty Company slot machine that will bring that arm down? I can get a new one, right? New to the new to you, but not new to the machines, the same era as the machine. This is why there's a whole market, just like there's a whole market for auto parts, there's a whole market for collectible or antique parts. So if you've got a drawer full of drawer pulls, or if you've got a cabinet full of, you know, something else that's a part like drawers or like, um, you know, doorknobs or tiles, then you want to think about individually selling those for parts. And you know that you can do the markup on parts pretty well, even with antiques. I appreciate your questions. I really appreciate it when you share. And whenever I say share, you should go drink. <laughs> and of course, I'm Dr. Lori. This is Ask Dr. Lori, thanks for your questions. I'm here with your expert answers and I'll see you next time.